Jesus, for your faithfulness. Thank you for the words that have already been shared here this morning, Lord. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that we were in you and with you before the foundation of the world. And nothing has changed. Thank you, Lord. We bless you this morning and give you praise. And everybody said in Jesus' name, in Jesus amen. Name. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tammy, for sharing. Appreciate it very much. And thank you, Suzanne and Tammy and Peter, for leading us in worship. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Peter, can I say something to you? Sure. I don't need to continue. But you will. But do what Joyce Myers Praise the Lord. truth is we're not any different than anybody else. That's right. When I got into the ministry, <clears throat> I won't, I'm not going to get into all of my history, but I can tell you it, it was dark. I, I, I lived a pretty wild and insane life. And anybody that knew me back then knows that to be true. But Nobody came to me and said, you know, God's called you to preach. I just had this feeling yeah. as as opposite as it was from my normal way of thinking. We'd been saved, we got born again, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and all that, and we're really involved in the local church there in East Texas where we were living. And it just wouldn't go away. I gotta tell you, I did not have any rational way of explaining it. And I just finally just said, Lord, I'll just do, I'm going to do it because I think it's you. And if it isn't you, you can just stop it anytime you want. Yeah. And doors got open. He spoke to my pastor. My pastor came to me and prophesied over me. And we uh, left the security that we had there because I could have stayed and been an assistant there. And it was a huge church. It was a big church, lots of finances. It would have been a good deal. But we felt led that we were supposed to come back here with a message that nobody back here was really preaching. Mm -hmm. And we started out in the Legion Hall in Ankeny. And we'd have to go in, because it was a beer joint, basically. And we'd have to go in on Sunday morning, scrub the beer off the floor, to open it up and try to air it out so it didn't smell like a brewery. Mm -hmm. And then we'd have church with Sally, me, and James. Allison, and the little kid that lived across the street. And that was it. And then little by little, we got a few more and a few more, and we moved to another little building, and then eventually to another bar that we remodeled and held some of you all remember that place. John was coming at that time and some of the others. But um, we never saw any huge growth. I mean, we never saw, you know, like I thought it was going to be. It was just plodding away. It was just... And I was working a full-time job at the time, plus the ministry. And basically, the full-time job is what was paying for the ministry because there were a few people, and with a few exceptions, like John, 
they were people that were unsaved. They were people that didn't know the Lord. They had all kinds of problems, financial, along with everything else. They didn't have money to give. And uh, so it was basically us, our job subsidizing the ministry. And that went on for a number of years. And then we would bought a house there in Ankeny at the time. It was an older home and we fixed it up and made it decent, made a little money off of it when we sold it, but still, um, I started having feedback from people that came from the denomination that I was in because I wasn't preaching the strict message that they were used to. And I've told you some of those stories, but anyway, I was praying in that building one day and really frustrated and depressed and bummed out about everything basically in general. And the Lord told me, he said, unless you go back to the beginning, go back to the word of God and start there, there's nothing's ever gonna change. You're gonna be dealing with this forever. Now God was still faithful to us. He got us through this stuff. But it was, we weren't trusting in the way that we do today because we didn't know to. We were just doing the best we could. So I resigned that church and uh, went back into sales eventually is what I ended up doing. And that's what I was doing when we were asked to take this church when it was out in the uh, trailer park over on the south side. And I got to tell you, I wasn't excited about it. Neither was Sally. I, I told the guy that pastored at the time, which was Darlene's uh, son, son-in-law, that I'd, pay, I'd preach for him. I mean, I'd help him out and give him some time off and preach for him, but I didn't really want to take the church. But he wanted out. He wasn't really a preacher. He was more of a worship leader than he was. And he was a great worship leader. And he did good pastoring too, but he just didn't feel comfortable with it and didn't want to do it. So I just told the Lord, I said, well, I believe it's you, but I don't want any part of it unless Sally's on board 100%. Because you know Things don't work out real well when you're trying to do one thing and your wife is wanting to do something else. You know, it just doesn't happen. So, as she said, I came home. I was on the road all the time at that, the job that I had. I'd get home on, I'd leave on Monday morning and generally I wouldn't get back until Friday night. Once in a while I'd get a break during the week and I'd be back in the area in the middle of the week. But at this particular time it was, I'd left on Monday, on Monday morning early and. I was in a wheelchair. Yeah, she had, she was off of her job because she had hurt her ankle or uh, 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 Achilles tendon and so I came back and uh, I no more and walked in the door and she said I think the Lord wants you to take that church well we did but and the church there was some people in the church I don't know what I don't remember now John what 15 maybe something like that somewhere in that area and the, the building it cost more to heat and air condition the building than the income was off of it Plus, you had to pay the rent on it, too. And so it didn't look real promising from a financial standpoint. And uh, I, the Lord told me, he said, if you take this, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Not something else and this, but just this. So we both were unemployed except for the church. And here's the deal. It wasn't like money just fell out of heaven. We cleaned up construction sites. I painted houses, uh, exterior. Sally was painting interior, uh, the same houses we were, new houses that were being built. Um, I don't even remember all the junk, the different odd, weird jobs that I did just to keep income going so we wouldn't lose our home because by that time we had purchased a new home out where we live today. And uh, you know how many know house payments don't stop just because you decide to change your vocation, you know? So anyway, um, but little by little, uh, things happened, and you know the story how we ended up here and people paying off the loan and everything else. But what I'm saying is this. There was never a time when there wasn't a challenge sure. to our faith. I mean, it never, I mean, it's more, it's easier to deal with today because I've seen God work. I have confidence in what he'll do. There I was still trying to make sure that I wasn't just doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing and didn't know any better and expecting God to bless it. But it's our, it's our faith, and that's what it is. And it's not perfect faith. It gets better. It can grow. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. But the truth is, if you don't take a, grip, if you don't take a chance, you won't know. Amen. I, and that's the hard thing. I've had people come, and they wanted to preach, and uh, I... It's fine, you know, and they wanted to pastor a church somewhere. And it's good. I'll back you up. I'll do everything I can to help you. 
but it, ne it seldom ever happens in a way that it, it, the path is just paved for you. Right. It, it's, there's always fa faith involved. Mm -hmm. And the th one thing I've seen is that people that don't step out in faith don't do it. Now, it doesn't mean that their life is ruined. It just means it's not going to go that direction. You know, it isn't going to happen. And so, praise the Lord. I was just thinking today, I, my uh, cousin passed away this week. He's the same age I am, uh, Joe Adino. And uh, we were the same. We were really close when we were kids. And uh, in fact, uh, he went in the Marine Corps right after me. I had just gotten out of uh, training and was permanent personnel. Y'all in the military know what I'm talking about. At uh, Camp Pendleton out on San Onofre, which is a training place for infantry training. And uh, he was going through training at the time, so I got to interact with him a little bit. Because I was permanent personnel, if you're a PFC, you're a general, I mean, in terms of these guys that are still going through training. And uh, so I got to spend a little time with him there, and then we both ended up in Vietnam and came back, and uh, he was going to school here in Des Moines. We roomed for a while and hung out and partied and did all the crazy stuff that you can imagine 21-year-olds do back in those days. But um, then I got into the ministry. We'd come back here to Iowa, and I was preaching all over the state of Iowa and Illinois, and, uh, Nebraska. They lived in Sioux City, and we, I was going to preach a, co a conference or a, I don't know, a rally or something. I don't remember now what it was in Sioux City, and then I was going to do another one in, in Nebraska. And they let us stay in their home. He was a, they're Catholic, but charismatic Catholics. He would received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were very supportive. They came to the meetings. And, you know, they were, and I thought, you know, same age as me, died of cancer. Really good guy. Loves the Lord. And how he intertwines our lives with people. You know, I mean, he's with the Lord right now. He already, he's got all the answers, you know, that we're still looking for. But I just, I mean, it really was on my mind this week thinking how, how, like Tammy said, from the time I was a little kid, and he was, God had made this thread, this way of, and who knows, sometimes the things that are worst in our lives are the things that produce the best things out of us. And, you know, if you had rough childhood, hard childhood, disciplined childhood, you know, yeah, there's a lot of negatives about that. But it also forces you to be more disciplined for yourself so that you don't give up, that you don't just quit because crap happens, because it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And all of us know that. We've all lived long enough to know that, you know, the only way you lose is to give up. Mm -hmm. And that, this is, I'm not you know, singling anybody out. I'm not judging anybody. Look, I've had plenty of times when I just, you know, and Sally will tell you, there's been times I've told her, I'm sick of this. Crap. I don't want to do this. I'm done with it. I'm finished, you know, just because something happens and, you know, multiple things usually happen and you get kind of frustrated with it also. But I'm just saying, I'm just rambling is what I'm doing, I'm trying to get my head together here for where I want to go. But I appreciate what Tammy was saying because it is so true and in tune with, with what it is I want to talk to you about. So praise the Lord. Just Let me just say this. If life gives you melons, you're dyslexic. <laughs> a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. That's what the Bible says. You know, and that's why I do this, not because I'm, uh, you know, working on a, next career, but I think God likes us to be happy. Happy, yes. science has proven this, that laughter is medicine. I mean, it actually does affect your whole body, your whole internal organs and everything else. So that's part of the reason. Plus I like stupid jokes. <laughs> and we talked about this here a while back, you know, how that light does travel faster than sound. And I can prove it because that's, the, I mean, that's the way that you, you know, uh, understand that some people appear to be really bright until they start talking. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I was just going to tell Tammy, too, I had a dream, too, last night, in fact. And uh, 
it wasn't just because I overate at the family get together. <laughs> but I had this dream that I was swimming in an ocean of orange soda. It was weird. But I realized it was just a fantasy. <laughs> And I'm going to really lay it on the line here this morning because probably some of you have already suspected this, but I've got a split personality. I'm just being frank with you. <laughs> okay. Anybody know what the, uh, what did the Chinese janitor say when he jumped out of the closet? Supplies. <laughs> I love that one. That's a good <laughs> supply. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. All right, praise the Lord. Now, here's a, I want to start right with this. Now, keep in mind what Tammy was saying earlier, what she was uh, sharing with us. And then I'm going to read to you out of the Message Bible uh, from the book of Galatians. And, and if you can, try to listen to what I'm reading here, and then use that as the context for everything that I'm going to say after this, okay? So here's what, here's what Paul wrote, and this is in the, again, it's in the Message Bible, so it's closer to the normal vernacular, the normal way of speaking that he would have been speaking only in Hebrew, right? So he says, we Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jews. Now this is uh, second, uh, Galatians chapter 2, I should say, Galatians chapter 2 and beginning at verse 16. He said, we Jews know that we have no advantage of birth over non-Jews or non-Jewish sinners. We know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping, but only through personal faith in Jesus Christ. How do we know? We tried it. And we had the best system of rules the world has ever seen. Convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believed in Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting in the Messiah and not by trying to be good. Have some of you noticed that we are not yet perfect? No great surprise, right? Are you ready to make the accusation that since people like me who go through Christ in order to get things right with God aren't perfectly virtuous, Christ must therefore be an accessory to sin? The accusation is frivolous. If I was trying to be good, I would be rebuilding the same old barn that I tore down. I would be acting as a charlatan. What actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It's no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I'm no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but it's the, it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not going back on that. Is it not clear to you that to go back to that old rule-keeping, peer-pleasing religion would be an abandonment of everything personal and free in my relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I refuse to do that, to repudiate God's grace. If a living relationship with God could come by rule-keeping, then Christ died unnecessarily. Chapter 3. You crazy Galatians, did someone put a hex on you? Have you taken leave of your senses? Something crazy has happened, for it's obvious that you no longer have the crucified Jesus in clear focus in your lives. His sacrifice on the cross was certainly set before you clearly enough. Let me put this question to you. How did your new life begin? Was it by working your heads off to please God? Or was it by responding to God's message to you? Are you going to continue this craziness? For only crazy people would think they could complete by their own efforts what was begun by God. If you weren't smart enough or strong enough to begin it, how do you suppose you could perfect it? Did you go through this whole painful learning process for nothing? Is it not yet a total loss? It is not yet a total loss, but it certainly will be if you keep this up. Answer this question. Does the God who lavishly provides you with his own presence, his Holy Spirit, 
working things in your lives that you could never do for yourselves? Does he do these things because of your strenuous moral striving or because you trust him to do them in you? Don't these things happen among you just as they happened with Abraham? He believed God, and that act of belief was turned into a life that was right with God. Is it not obvious to you that persons who put their trust in Christ, not persons who put their trust in the law, are like Abraham, children of faith? It was all laid out beforehand in Scripture that God would set things right with non-Jews by faith. Scripture anticipated this in the promise to Abraham, all nations will be blessed in you. So those now who live by faith are blessed along with Abraham who lived by faith. This is no new doctrine, and that means that anyone who tries to live by his own effort, independent of God, is doomed to failure. Scripture backs this up. Utterly cursed is every person who fails to carry out every detail written in the book of the law. The obvious impossibility of carrying out such a moral program should make it plain that no one can sustain a relationship with God that way. The person who lives in right relationship with God does it by embracing what God arranges for him. Doing things for God is the opposite of entering into what God does for you. Habakkuk had it right. The person who believes God is set right by God, and that's the real life. Rule keeping does not naturally evolve into living by faith, but only perpetuates itself in more and more rule keeping a fact observed in Scripture. The one who does these things, rule keeping, continues to live by them. Christ redeemed us from that self-defeating, cursed life by absorbing it completely into himself. Do you remember the Scripture that says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree? That is what happened when Jesus was nailed to the cross. He became a curse and at the same time dissolved the curse. And now because of that, the air is cleared and we can see that Abraham's blessing is present and available for non-Jews too. We are all able to receive God's life, His Spirit, in and with us by believing just the way Abraham received it. Praise the Lord. Now let's look at Mark chapter 9 and verse 24 with that in mind, what Paul preached and taught and wrote to the Galatians. Straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Yes. How many have been there? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. All right, Romans 14, verses 1 through 6. Romans 14, 1 through 6. Again, you need to keep in context what Paul's revealing to us. This is about just trusting that Jesus is enough. And that he wants to do for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. So him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and gives God thanks. So there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that makes it really clear as to what's right and what's wrong or what's good and what's evil. Mm -hmm. But there are other things that are left up to the convictions of the individual believer. Mm -hmm. And that's where faith comes in. You don't need faith to know thou shalt not kill. Right. Right? I mean, it's just obvious. We just know that that's not good. It's an evil. It's a bad thing. But that's what Romans 14 is dealing with what foods to eat, whether to drink wine or not, what, to, what day to observe the Sabbath on, and so on and so on. And he just picked out some specific things. But there are other issues that we all go through that we have to make decisions about that may not be a clear yes or no from the Bible. So Paul says we are to make our own conclusions in those matters. 
God hasn't created us as robots. That's what religion tries to do. It tries to make you a, you know, a robot. Uh, just a push the button and this is what I do, right? God hasn't created us as robots. He allows us freedom to draw our own conclusions in a lot of areas of our life. Yeah. Now, because of that, our beliefs are going to differ from one another. Two believers could have opposite convictions on the same subject, but both could be right in the eyes of God. Yeah. And you won't, religion won't ever tell you that. It can't be. Everybody's got to get in line and follow the marching order, right? Mm -hmm. But look at this. In Romans chapter 14 now, Peter, verses 22 and 23. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So it's not necessarily sin to have a glass of wine. It's not necessarily sin to eat pork. Right? right? Unless you're convicted not to. And if you're convicted not to, then you best not be doing it because that becomes sin. You're out there. Now, if you don't feel a great conviction about it, if you don't feel like, hey, God's not killing me over this, if there's no condemnation, then God's okay with it. Yes. All right, but we all got different issues. Some could have a drink of wine, but some couldn't unless they had a gallon. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, some could eat. You know, a, a rib sandwich. Well, others got to have the whole hog. Right. Right? I mean, so sometimes you need to say, okay, yeah, it's okay, but I mean, there are, I need to use some common sense here. Right. And if you do that, God's okay with it. He's not trying to tell you there is just this way, the highway, you know, this way or the highway. Yeah. No, he's saying you need to develop personal convictions about things based on you. Because what's all right for you may not be all right for somebody else, or what's all right for them may not be a good thing for you. Right. That's where faith comes in. You've got to trust God that He's going to lead you in that way. Yes. Praise the Lord. So the opposite of this is true too. Whatever is of faith is blessed. So if I do something that you see as evil... And yet I feel no condemnation about it at all. And there's no specific word from God that says, thou shalt not. Right? Mm -hmm. Then I can be blessed in the very thing that would curse you. Sure. Why? Because my faith is established in my, I've drawn a conclusion based on how God is dealing with me about it. And it's okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's okay for everybody. It just means it's okay for me because I got the okay with God. Right. There's no condemnation for me. Right? Right. So... Something powerful happens when we choose to do everything by faith. And this is what Tammy's talking about in, in my own way of trying to express it. We reach conclusions by faith. We reach conclusions and then we speak and act on those conclusions. Jesus is the high priest of our confession. And I believe that's what it means that he's forever making intercession for us. In other words, he takes my conclusion that I've come to, and then he says, it's okay. This is not bad. This is not a wrong, this is not a wrong thing. It's not a bad thing. And so he intercedes, or he honors, as my high priest of my confession, he honors it before God, or he brings it before God as the high priest would bring the offering, amen, under the old covenant. Praise the Lord. Why? Because he's the sacrifice, amen, that I have my faith in. Yeah. Right? That he loves me. That he's going to back me up. That he's going to bless me. That he's not trying to judge me or to, to hurt me. He's trying to get me to trust him and to have faith in him. Amen. Look, you're out working on the job and you've got this thing going on. Or just, I, I don't want to pick on Peter here, but it's just, just like for me. I didn't have a, there was, there was no place in here that I could go and say, Nathan, you're supposed to be a preacher. Right. In fact, everything that I read here said the opposite. Yeah. 
your history is saying, man, you need to, you, you need to be preached too, buddy, and, and good and continuously, right? But something else inside of me, the Holy Spirit was saying something else. And so eventually I got to the place where I had confidence in that, and it took things. It took chances. I had to step out in faith. I, I remember one time I, I was in the prayer room. We had prayer rooms in that church that were bigger than this church. Yeah. Tammy will tell you, she, was, she went there too. And, and I remember being in there because we'd always go in before services and pray. And, and other times we'd just come and use the prayer room for prayer. And I can remember being in there praying. And I was agonizing over this because, I mean, I was just another guy. I, I mowed the yard. I changed the signs and stuff on the church. That, I was just doing whatever I could do to be part of something that God was involved in. I didn't have any spiritual position or anything like that. But I can remember praying and just really crying out to God and saying, God, if, if this is you, if you really want me to do this, I've got to have something outside of me. I've got to know. And so I said, Brother Edwards, you're going to have to have Brother Edwards. He was the pastor. Say something to me. Well, I came out of the prayer room, and I was, there was a big circle area that went around the sanctuary part and then there were Sunday school rooms and stuff out in that, that area and then there was a wing off to this side which is where the offices were and uh, so forth, the kitchen and that and uh, as I was coming out he was coming towards the prayer room and he stopped me and he said uh, I need to talk to you for a minute and I thought oh God I've done something you know, <laughs> I've screwed up something so he called me in his office and he said you know I, I was gone for several days this week he was preaching somewhere I don't remember where and he said uh, I was talking to the Lord about an assistant, and he said, uh, I was going to go over to Texas Bible College and get one of the young guys that are just coming out, or, or people that are coming out of Bible College, and he said, the Lord stopped me, and he said, you've already got an assistant, and he said, I said, what, <laughs> and he said, yeah, you've already got an assistant, and he said, who, and he said, Nathan, now I could tell by his expression, he was more shocked than I was, because <laughs> he wasn't expecting this at all, but I can tell you this, from that moment on, he did everything he could to support me. They gave us a church van to drive when our little Chevy Chevette shot craps. And uh, I mean, we, we ended up renting their house, the, a parsonage that they had lived in before they built their new house. And uh, gave me opportunities to preach, introduced me to other pastors, just... <clears throat> Put me in charge of the bus ministry. Put me in charge of the junior high Sunday school, which is a junior high Sunday school class was 50, 60 kids. In fact, it got so big that we had to separate the girls from the boys. So the girls were in one class and the boys were in another class, and it was still a huge, huge class. Then I ended up teaching the new converts, people who were just getting born again, just getting the Holy Spirit, and I would, I would teach that class because they wouldn't be in the sanctuary with everybody else because a lot of stuff that was being taught there was just beyond them. They weren't ready for it, you know. I mean, these are crucial things. People's kids, uh, you know, the new people just coming into the church, how easily I could have screwed that up. I mean, all it would have taken was just one stupid thing, you know, and, and twist people off and be the end of it. So he had all kinds of confidence. He supported me when I had to go up before the board. To, you know, you take oral exams and written exams and all this stuff to get in. And uh, I thought, you know, this, this ain't going to fly. Because once they find out, I went to, with him to Houston one day, and he was just talking to me. And, Asked about marriage, and he said, have you, been, have you been married before? And I said, yeah, three times. You see the expression on your face, yeah. This is my fourth wife, but it's my only wife. We've been married for 40 years. But I'm telling you, I was a rounder, you know. I, I had three wives before that. And that's not something you do in a Pentecostal right. church. You know, I mean, it's like you got to be straight, square, and, you know, all that. Well, I wasn't, and I knew that, because and I, and, I just, I told him, I said, look, I don't need to be licensed. I can do this without a license. I know the message. I, I know what to preach. I don't have to have a, he said, no, no, I want you to go through the process. And I did, and they accepted me. And I'll say this about that organization. They didn't hold your past against you. When you were born again, they really believed that you were a new creature in Christ, and they gave you the opportunity. Now, I don't share this all the time, because I know some things you hear, you just can't unhear. But it's a fact. There's no point in hiding it. And I'm like, Paul, I don't care. I'm not worried about somebody else's opinion. You know, I've got God's opinion. Yeah. And he's proven it to me over and over and over. He's okay. Yes. You know, I was a screw-up. I was a selfish, 
self-indulgent drug, you know. I mean, I, I always had a job, but it had to be a job that I could do while I was high. Yeah. Because I was always high, too. That's why I was in sales all the time, praise the Lord. I'm just saying. I had to learn to trust God. Yes. And with my history, I just thought, it isn't what I'm going to believe, it's what they're going to believe. They're not going to accept this at all. But they did, with open arms. I came up here, my pastor came with me, we tried out for the church up here. They were all on board, well, everything went great, until I decided that maybe the message wasn't quite as biblical as I thought it was initially, you know. But nevertheless, powerful things happen when we choose to do things by faith. Yes. And that's just the truth. It's, it's scary, of course. 90% of everything I've done in my life, I've done it in fear. I spent four years in the Marine Corps. Dan talk to tell you about this. Anybody says they were never scared, just wasn't into any crap that was scary. You know, I mean, I was frightened plenty of times. But you just learn to do it scared. You just don't let the fear keep you from doing what it is you're supposed to do. There's no sin in being afraid. The sin is giving into it or yielding and letting it dominate your life. Because that's not faith. So something, something powerful happens when we choose to do things by faith. Jesus, as I said, he's, he's the one backing us up. He is the high priest of our confession. Whether I'm saying it out loud or whether it's something that I'm dealing with internally, right? And that moves us to believe that God is with us in every situation. Amen. Now, I know what... You know, Proverbs 16, 25, I, I realize, you know, the way that seems right to a man in the end of that is death. I get it. But even so, we have to come to the place of having confidence in everything that we do and believe or we won't do anything. Right. We, see, we're vulnerable to the devil in whatever we are habitually in doubt about. Yep. Yes. So it's a serious matter to go after the root of our doubt and start living by faith. The way you go after the root of your doubt is you just overcome it by faith. You just don't let the doubt dominate or dictate to you. Now, I'm, I'm saying, I'm not perfect at this. I still, we still battle with it. You know, but it's, it's, you do it, you see God move, and then the next time you're confronted again, just like Israel was, it's scary. Yeah, oh no, <laughs> I mean, I know what he did then, but, but that, that, Focus on what he has been faithful to you about gives you the impetus or the, the initiative to give it another shot. He was faithful there. He did it there. And that's how faith grows. You get closer and closer to understanding that God's got your back. Yes. He really is out to help you. He, is, he wants to bless you. Yes. Yes. Amen. So let's look at this uh, Mark chapter 9 verse 23. He that doubteth is dead. Okay, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. Mm -hmm. yes. This is the word of God speaking. Yes. And he says, If you can believe, anything, everything is possible if you can believe it. Yes. And I, my life is a testimony to this. I'm telling you. Amen. It, you know, it, it, it took a lot to catch Jesus off guard. I mean, he was, he was God, but he was living as a man sure in this planet, subject to all the same stuff we go through. You know, he, he looked at a, a Samaritan woman, and, she, and he knew how many husbands she'd had. Sure. He sent his disciples to find donkeys, spare rooms, mm -hmm. fish with coins in their mouth. And all of that he had done, he did by supernatural knowledge. He saw through the tricks of the Pharisees when they tried to trap him. And he had the ability to discern people's hearts. He saw the good in people that he had just met. He didn't, had never seen them before, didn't know anything about them. And he also saw the evil intentions in other people. And yet, Jesus could be shocked. Mark chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. And he could there do no mighty works. This is in Nazareth. This is his hometown. 
He could do no mighty work save he, that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about the villages teaching. So he was shocked. He, he was marveled. He marveled. He was in awe of how unbelieving these people were. Now, maybe he expected more was going to take place in Nazareth. There would be a greater meeting, more people healed, more divine miracles, more, you know, who knows what. But the opposite is what happened. The lack of belief in Nazareth basically left him shaking his head like, I don't, I don't, I can't believe this. All right, now look at Luke chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house of censure, and sent, sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest in, enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto you. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Verse 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. So again, he was stunned. He was shocked. He was in awe. He was amazed. He was taken back. The Son of God, who knew spouse counts, knew where the donkeys were hid, mm -hmm. knew where money-eating fish lived, mm -hmm. and people's most secret thoughts could be stunned. And in both cases, it was faith or the absence of faith that caused him to wonder. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 11.6. See, I can honestly say if I've ever done anything for the Lord, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I had, except for one thing. I have believed him. Not perfectly, but the thing that has made God real to me is the fact that I have believed him to be real and believed him faithful to his word. Now, I've, I've made plenty of mistakes. I've done plenty of things intentionally and unintentionally that were contrary to what I know God would have wanted me to do. But I still believed him. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's why that's so powerful. Without faith, it's impossible to please him because he that comes to God has to believe that he is and that he rewards those who believe him yeah. to be. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 11, 6. That was it. So without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? And with faith, nothing will be impossible for us. Right. So you can see faith is the key to everything. Yes, it is. Faith isn't something that we can fake. Faith is really about two things. <clears throat> Trusting God's character and then stepping out because of that trust. And that's why faith matters so much, because it's about his integrity. The most important thing about faith isn't miracles. It's not about healings. Those are all great, and, and, and they, we should experience them. But it's about relationship, because that's what we had in the beginning. We came out from him. And the scripture says we go back to him. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. See, the key to intimacy in any kind of relationship, and I've already told you I've had plenty of failures in that area, but I've had one that's been relatively successful <laughs> because of her endurance, praise the Lord. But the key to intimacy in any relation isn't sight and it isn't touch. It isn't being able to see them all the time or being able to hold them and make sure that they're not going to do something stupid. Or you're not. It's trust. It's trusting. If I'm not there, it'll be the same as if I was there. Yes. If she's not here, she knows I'll be the same as if I was. Right. If I see her, if I don't see her. If we're right next to each other or if we're 500 miles apart. Right. We trust. And that's the key to intimacy. And without that, you don't have a relationship. Amen. That sort of faith isn't something that can be hyped up. Can't be manipulated into existence but it can grow mm -hmm. in other words faith is loyalty to Jesus yes, it is. 
So by definition, growing in faith is ultimately about learning to know, to lean on, and to depend on his character. The same way any relationship grows. Look at James 2 and verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. That's powerful. Just think about when, when, when my spirit leaves my body, the body's dead. It only, it's only lives because of the spirit that's in it. When we die, the spirit immediately is absent from the body and present with the Lord. And he says, it's the same way with faith. If you don't do anything to show evidence of your faith, it's the same as if they were separate. Totally, totally different entities. Praise the Lord. Faith is a verb. It's a doing word. It is. Mark 2, Mark 2, chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 12. And he again entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they came, come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were, cert there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sin but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go on thy way uh, into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. So, uh, if you can, Peter, go back to verse 5. And he, when Jesus saw their faith, he saw their faith. So, what was the giveaway that they had faith? The hole in the roof. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Faith is an action. Yes. And these guys would do anything to get their buddy to the one that they believed could heal him. Yeah, so sometimes we have to act even when we can't see God. Uh -huh. Even when we don't have a clear audible voice and everything is laid out you know uh -huh. before saying this is the way this is this is how it's going to work you have to come to a conclusion yes. that god is faithful that god cares yes. sometimes we have to believe god's presence even when we don't sense his presence when we don't feel his presence and when the circumstances are saying this ain't going to work See, it's interesting to me that the scripture says, and he forgave him his sins. Now, the guy was there because he was sick. And Jesus forgave him his sin. What was the sin? Unbelief. That's the only sin there is. Are you with me? If you can believe, anything's possible. And faith is the only approach that we have to God. And that's what Jesus was acknowledging. He said, that sin of unbelief, the sin, the only sin you've got, it's forgiven. And you're healed. Because you believed. How do I know you believe? Well, you tore the roof off the house to get here for me to pray for you. Real faith is just stepping out of the boat and trusting that Jesus is going to hold you up. Because we know we can't walk on water. But if Jesus is there, yeah. even if I can't, I'm not going to drown. The worst that's going to happen is I'll sink a little. Yeah. 
I'll get wet. That isn't that life. We take risks. We step out of the boat knowing that I can't do this. This isn't, I'm not capable of this. But if he's here, he'll see to it that I make it. I, I survive it. I get through it. I'll, I'll, yes. I'll be all right. Yes. Yes. That's faith. It isn't having all the answers. It isn't knowing, okay, I've got some kind of, you know, theory on gravity and, uh, you know, weight uh, versus dispersion, you know, over space and all this other stuff. No, I, I just, I don't know. I know that generally people sink and drown when they get in the water and they don't know how to swim. Right. But if Jesus is there, yeah. somehow I'll either walk on that water or he'll carry me. Yep. I'll either get past this doubt by trusting him or he will just save me. Yes. If faith is trusting God's character, then just think about it. The best way to grow your faith is to get to know him better. Yes. I can promise you this. Imperfect faith always comes from imperfect knowledge. If we are not excited about God's promises... It's because we really don't appreciate the fact that God is always faithful to his word. We don't know him well enough. Right. We know what the word says, but we're not sure will he really back this up for me. Yeah. 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 Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 44. There came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed, and he straightly charged him forthwith and sent him away. And he said unto him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So the, the leper didn't doubt that Jesus was capable of healing him. He just doubted that he would. I mean, he knew he was, it was possible for Jesus to do it. He knew he had the ability to do it, because he'd heard, he'd seen other people talking about it. And so he knew that he could, the question was whether he was going to or whether he would. Now, isn't that what we all deal with? We know that nothing is impossible with God. But I don't know if he, you know, this wreck, this mess. See, we trust that God is powerful enough, but we doubt whether he's willing enough. Look at verse, again, if you can, Peter, verse 40 and 41. So the leper comes to him, and he's begging him, and he's kneeling down, and he says, If you will, can you make me clean? I mean, come on, this is a prayer we all pray at times. We've, we've cried out, Oh, God, if you, if you would just do this, I, mean, I know you can heal this thing. I know you can deliver this. I know you can make this happen. I know you can fix this thing. If you will. Yeah. And Jesus was moved with compassion, and he put his hand and touched him, and he said unto him, I will be clean. Now, here's what is going on here. Jesus is basically saying, I'm willing. I'm as willing as I am able. Yeah. And he basically says to the guy, obviously, you've never met me. Yeah. You've heard about me, but you really don't know me, or you wouldn't have ever asked that. Yeah. Mark 1, 43 and 44. Now, this is what blows my mind. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was clean. And Jesus charged him and forthwith sent him away. And he said to him, don't say anything about this to anybody. Right? Go show yourself to the priest, which was the responsibility of anybody who had been healed under the, under the old covenant, which is where they were still at, so that he could be accepted back into the, the community and into the synagogue and so forth. And so, but Jesus said, don't say nothing. Don't tell anybody. And that fascinates me. And that's not just here. There's other places where he does the same thing. He told people that, that he had healed to just keep quiet about it. 
Now, I mean, if we healed someone of leprosy, yeah. we'd want to make a YouTube video <laughs> and hope that it went viral. Yeah. Jesus was not interested in publicity. He just had compassion. He just did it because of them, yes. because they needed something done. Yeah. Not because he wanted to be the star. Right. Now, let's look at the God of the Bible, whom Jesus is the exact revelation of. A God who gives to this unimaginable extent, exceeding abundantly above all or anything that we could even imagine, mm -hmm. let alone ask for. He gave his only son, himself, in the flesh, not only to live with us, but to die for us. Mm -hmm. Now look at Romans 8, 31 and 32. He's not, he, he does everything he can. It's like Tammy said, he's doing everything he can to make this understandable to us. Mm -hmm. What shall we then say to these things? Whatever your thing is. If God's for us, who can be against us? When, I'm going, when I was going through all this stuff and trying to figure out, oh my God, all this mess that I've got and all, these, all this history and all the stuff that could come up and people might say and come back into my life and blah, 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 blah. If God's for me, what, do I, yeah. what am I going to say to these things? If God's for me, who can be against me? Mm -hmm. He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If you were willing to die for me, why would I doubt that there's anything that you would withhold from me? Exactly. Exactly. So, here's the deal. Increasing our faith is just simply realizing the truth about who God is. Our faith grows by recognizing God as the faithful one. The one who is always true to his word. Yes. Who cannot lie. Who never changes. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the, fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he's faithful that promised. Why is it that we hold fast to what it is we're confessing based on the word of God? Because the one that said it is faithful to everything he said. Yes. If he said it, he'll do it. Amen. If someone will believe it. Remember, as I said earlier, he didn't create us as robots. We have to reach conclusions. And somebody said faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Risk. We all want to be 100% sure that we know that we've heard God correctly. We want to know precisely what he said before we take a step of faith. But I can tell you from my own experience, that rarely happens. I wish it were that way all the time, and we'd all be doing everything by faith. But it, that isn't faith, is it? Exactly. If you know exactly what the outcome's going to be, it's not faith. It's just a, a, a rite. It's just a ritual. It's just something you're doing. If we get caught up in the hunt for clarity, our faith will never grow. If, I, if I'd have had to wait until I had precise direction for everything I've done in, in terms of my, my experience with God, I'd still be selling farting Santas. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I sold novelties for a while. <laughs> Made a lot of money at it. But it wasn't the most, uh, I don't know, esteemed position that a person could have. But people like farting Santas, and they, they like witches who belch, and all that stuff. If you don't believe me, check out your local Quick Trip or someplace where they have the little novelty stands. I sold that stuff all over, Iowa, Illinois, and I made a lot of money. I didn't get a lot of prideful looks from people, like, wow, man, I'd like to have that job. But you know what? When you need a, when you need a paycheck, you'll, you'll do just about anything if it's legal. I did. I mean, I wasn't ashamed of it. It was paying for my house payments. It was feeding my family. Amen. And I kind of got a kick out of it. I like rubbing the cat the wrong way most of the time anyway, so it kind of 
fit my personality just about right. Praise the Lord. Well, you're getting some real inf inside information here about me. If I see any of you here next week, I'll be amazed. It'll, it'll have to be a God thing. Psalm 71, uh, verses 14 through 18. This is a life scripture for me. It has been for a number of years, but it becomes more and more so the older I get. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord. I will make mention of thy righteousness even of thine only. O oh God, thou hast taught me from my youth and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Yes. I don't like getting emotional sometimes. I can't help it. That's the way the Holy Spirit works with me, and I think it's kind of just God's way of rubbing this cat the wrong way because he knows I don't like it. But there's an old saying that knowledge is only a rumor until it lives in a muscle. And that basically means what we understand about faith is only a theory until it becomes an experience. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's no substitute for stepping out in our vulnerability to see that God is able to carry us yes. and willing to carry us yes. all the way. Yes. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, in Hebrews 11, Abraham's listed as a hero of faith. God promised he would have innumerable descendants, even though he and Sarah were too old and she had been barren all of her life. Now look at Romans 4 and 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now remember the scripture says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his yes. righteousness, and all of these things get added to you. Uh -huh. Now since he's such a legend, Abraham, and he's got this high standing in the house of faith. You might have expected him to have this smooth trajectory from faith to ever increasing faith, right? But he didn't. He was like us. Yeah, he was. We were like, we are like him. Though he believed God when God spoke to him, Abraham wavered and doubted multiple times. When God's promise of a son didn't happen, as soon as Abraham thought it should, he did like most of the rest of us would have done. He tried to figure out a way to make it happen himself. And he got an issue. A big mistake. Yeah. Then he goes to Abimelech. He's in Egypt. And he gives him his, his wife. Abraham gives Abimelech his wife because he's afraid that, he's gonna, that Abimelech's going to kill him and take her anyway. So he tells him, that's my sister. Fine. She, you can have her. But in Hebrews 11, he's this great man of faith. Yeah. But I just caution you, read the whole story in Genesis because you're clearly told that he wavered between fear and faith all the time. He's just like us. Yeah. Nothing to be ashamed of, mm -hmm. to be afraid. No. The shame is only an unwillingness to confront it. So Abraham kept coming back in spite of his failures. Praise the Lord. Yes. It's our history, folks. I mean, it's our, our biography as much as it is Abraham's. And his faith was refined on this journey of life. Yes. He ended up the father of faith. He had his share of doubts along the way, just like all of us. 
I promise you when this is all said and done, you'll be in that same house of faith. You'll be in the same hall of fame of the faithful. Because you notice there under the new covenant, there's no mention of any of his failures. There's no mention of any of his fears. There's no mention of any of his doubts or his wavering. It's only that he believed God and God said, that makes you righteous as far as I'm concerned. And God is just simply saying, the more we trust, the more we get to know his character. And our trust increases as a result of that. It's a cycle. Faith is based on total trust in Jesus. It's the cycle that Tammy talked about. We've never left eternity. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world, and we'll be in him at the end of this world. Because we were in the supernatural. We were in the spirit realm. We were in eternity from day one. We just had to have a body that's limited to time and space to make us legal here. But we've been legal in eternity from before the foundation of the world. Yeah. I'll close with this last scripture. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Don't beat yourself up. Just pick yourself up. Yes. Just get back. Just get back in it. That's all, that's all he's asking. And I promise you, every time you do that, your faith will grow. Sure. You'll be quicker to get up the next time. You'll be quicker to get out of the boat the next time. You'll be quicker to take the risk every time it happens. Yes. That's how we learn. And it isn't just about me having more faith. It's about me knowing him better. Yeah. And the better I know him, the more I can trust him. Mm-hmm. And the more I trust him, the more he proves himself faithful. Mm-hmm. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin What's the sin? (laughs) Unbelief, doubt, fear, which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus. How do we do it? Just like Tammy said, the focus is on him. Not on us failing, not on us fearing, not on us doubting. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. What was the contradiction? That they wouldn't believe who he was, that they they didn't expect him, that they didn't believe that he was God. He said, look at at the unbelief and the doubt and fear that he had to deal with. Uh And if you'll do that, you won't be wearied and faint in your mind. You'll keep believing in spite of the enemies always coming. That's why the scripture says 365 times it said, fear not. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. That is the antidote to unbelief. Fear not. Amen. Just do it. Like Sally said, like Joyce Meyer says, even if you've got to do it afraid, just do it. Yeah. You'll find the fear will leave in the act itself. Can you say praise the Lord? Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap. (laughs) Praise God. Don't anybody be ashamed. Don't anybody feel like, you know, there's something wrong with you because you doubt it, because you fear, because you're tentative about stepping out. This is about God trying to bring us back in to get us to have greater faith. Because I'll tell you what, whatever the thing is right now that you're wanting to have faith for, He's got something so much bigger than that in your future, and you've got to get past this thing to get to that thing. And that's all he's trying to do is to get you to believe for this because there's something far greater that's going to bless you in ways that you can't even imagine. But if you don't believe for this, it's a a bigger struggle to then believe for the next one. Praise the Lord. R-I-S-K. You've got to risk it to get the business, folks. Amen. Give the Lord another hand. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Live by faith.